Welcome everyone to the new Cyprus webinar where we have a guest from Siemens, Murat Oskan, who yeah. will tell us how we actually test the software. Murat, do you want to say hello, introduce yourself? Hi people, I am the person at Siemens Software Hub in Chicago who protects Siemens customers from terrible software. Excellent. Well, thank you, Murat, for protecting our customers from terrible software. And we do appreciate the costume. Not many guests dress up for a webinar. We do appreciate <laughs> it. And as always, I'm your host, Gleb Bakhmutov. I run engineering at Cyprus. You can find me on Twitter and you can find Murat on LinkedIn and GitHub. So here's the content for this webinar. It's a, an advanced webinar. We're going to show a lot of code samples that Murat has written a lot of plugins, a lot of advanced coding concepts. Don't worry about, you know, if you don't get something, the slides are already public. You can look at the slides to refresh your memory and there are lots of links to other materials. So everything that we are about to show is in the slides. So we'll talk about architecting tests, how you run tests, the usual plugins that Murat is using. Then we'll talk about the dashboard, how much it saves in terms of uh, time and then Murat is going to show how we avoid combinatorial explosion of running all the tests against all the environments and all the permutations. So that's, I'm looking forward to the last combinatorial configs with Cypress section. And finally, we are using Slido where you can ask your questions. So if you go to a Slido and enter code size Siemens, you'll be able to join the event ask your questions, upvote other people's questions, and we'll definitely take time to answer as many questions at the end of a webinar as possible. So go to Slido, enter the code, and you know, keep posting your questions. Okay, Murat, why don't you tell us about the system you're about to test? So the product we will be talking about is called Building Operator. Now, what is Building Operator? It's Siemens's flagship cloud application, and we call smart infrastructure section of Siemens. This is a SaaS solution. It's used to remotely monitor, operate, and troubleshoot buildings. Why did we make this thing? So we do building controls, building automation. Think of your smart home at a very large scale. Think of university campuses, stadiums, shopping malls, all that. We do HVAC, lighting, power, everything to control your building. Previously, we had desktop solutions, a workstation, a few million lines of code in C Sharp sitting in a Windows server somewhere. We had some embedded solutions that run an Angular server in a device, which is pretty cool. We had firmware in devices that you see in the middle part, and then floor level devices that could be thermostats, valves, light switches. Our competition had cloud products and people wanted something that runs in the browser. So we had to come up with a solution and that was building operator. Now, what does the architecture of the product look like? At a very high level, Angular front end, Node Express API. On the bottom side, we have the hardware. On the left side, we have the services. So what's the distinction? On the right side, the microservices are hosted on OpenShift. On the left side, the services we have, which are kind of generic services. If you think about the Cypress dashboard, for instance, users, organizations, subscriptions, they are Golandas. They are eventually consistent. In academia, people say, would say this is the ultimate way to build a system, but the reality resists simplicity. It's very difficult to build a system like this, more difficult to test it. This is why Cypress was a tool of choice when we started this in around the beginning of the year. The front end talks to the API, API talks to the hardware, API talks to the services, also the front end talks to the services. So the tool that we use has to be aware of everything in here. What does a test architecture look like? So first at UI level, and we're just going to talk about Cypress tests here. We have UI integration tests where the entire network layer are fixtured. So they don't have to know anything about the network at branches, commit, initial commits. After so, we start maybe converting some of these integration tests to UI end-to-end -end tests. And also we add API tests to be hitting our API backend and the services. Finally, once we're confident that everything's okay until that part, we start doing traditional UI end-to-end -end text without any fixtures. We're not mocking anything. We're testing real hardware with these. Nice. So what were we doing before? 
the first version of our product, we just had some microservices. We didn't have to integrate with the Go Lambdas. Everything was UI end to end. And this was a Sisyphean effort. There was no winning. We just were keeping the test running. Very costly and brittle. You don't need to invest so much time in these kind of tests. Check out this link on why that's nicely justified. Now, what's the architecture like? We use GitLab. So if you also use GitLab, you will like the code samples here. We have Angular and we proxy to any deployment of our API. Our API is not on the same repository as the front end. So we have to point to different deployments. And we have separation of concerns there. The other highlight is Glebs plugin. And we'll talk more about this one. Now, we can control what they run at branches. And then we can convert those tests into UI end-to-end -end tests in later stages. How do we control what we stop? Let's say I want to stop all the services. I just have a function, many routes, then you can look at Cypress documentation, why it's done this way. It basically says, use this file when hitting this endpoint and just alias it. At the spec file, we import this function. We have some logical check there to make sure of the environment that we're running. And then if we are in that environment, we stop everything. So this way it's very easy to switch things. It's, now- It's very interesting, Murat. Sorry for interrupting this, right? So when you run, test in a pull request on a branch when you stop everything, right? Yes. Runs all the uh, UI tests very quickly, right? But when you're testing development, staging, or production, you actually don't stop it. Right. And you go full, full test, perfect. Right. Yes. A better way, a meta way of doing this right now is using the Cypress script test plugin, which Glenn and another Cypress colleague works on. You should definitely check this one out. Now, what do we do at individual branches, the initial commits by developers? The first script from package.json runs the server test plugin. So it starts a server running the second command here. Let's say that's remote dev. All that does is starts the UI locally in the CI pipeline environment while pointing to another deployment, a live deployment of the backend. Once our UI is up and running at this URL, it runs the test command, which is the third line here. And Cypress users will be familiar with this. We have parallelization. We name the group so that it looks nice in the dashboard. And then we use a config file. And this is new in Cypress 350 or 360. 360, right? I believe. Yeah. So if, if this is not familiar, it's something new. You can specify config file right now. What's in the config file that's significant? It's really just the base URL saying, hey, run against this one. I'm going to call the environment this, and then I'm going to run certain test files. So this is all. At branch levels, we do UI integration and everything stopped. UI issues are isolated here. The only other part we want to talk about is the YAML file. So if you use GitLab, we only run on branches. And this is the test command from the previous screen that you saw. And you put down as many CI machines as you need. And it looks kind of like this, the stage and the jobs under it. Now, on later branches, when we're doing development or doing staging, they are very, very similar. We keep the package JSON clean. This is the only command that we have in the package JSON script. The config file changes between development and staging. So just replace development string here with staging and then change the base URL. That's the one thing that changes. And the other part is the test that we run in. So you have also flexibility to configure this on your own. And the YAML file is uh, in the job description, changes in development and staging. So instead of development.json, staging.json, maybe different group name. But you see here, we start converting the UI integration test more to end-to-end -to -end test. And then we start doing API testing. So now we have achieved isolation of UI issues. And then in the next layer, we achieved isolation of API issues and service issues. And finally, we start hitting the hardware build. So these usually run at night in cron jobs because they're slow to run tests that are maybe a little brittle. But once you get this pattern down, you will be the master of CI, right? So in this one stage, we have functional tests and then the cron job, we have some hardware tests and then we have different kinds of tools that we do performance testing. With. We run these maybe twice a night and 20 times over the weekend. The only thing you have to pay attention to is the time it takes between these different stages. So I increase the timer, it's that timeout. It's not going to wait that long. So if things are ready, 
the only reason you want to do this is if you read, if you use a dashboard and you want everything to go nicely display. So I have the end-to-end -end test on here, the hardware test over here, and some visual AI testing too, which we will talk to more about. So, so the entire, yes. Even though we started at a different time, as you can see, we're still grouped in a dashboard under a single logical test run. Correct. The whole reason that we do all this is to have issue isolation. When UI issues fail, we detect them at the UI. When API or service issues are working, easy to diagnose. Same thing with hardware. Nice. All right. So talked about the architecture abstraction and the product so far. Let's talk about some plugins. Now, the fixtures. Where do we get all the mocks? Usually you would open up their tools, copy whatever's in the network tab, one JSON file. But what if you have to record so many mocks, right? It's a complex test, so much network dependency. You can use either of the plugins. I think they're both really good. Or you can make your own. All you have to do is define a side server, which sits between Cypress wrapping your application and the network layer. And at that point, all you do is push create a new array with a URL method and data. The second section here is more like a filter. It will filter all the get requests from all URLs. And after everything's done, it will start creating fixture files for you. Now, how did we use this strategy? I didn't talk about one part of the system here that we abstracted. We have this device called Connect X300. It's a very cool device. It has a swarm of Docker containers or firmware, which you download and update with. But the challenge with it is that it takes about 15 minutes to get this ready from factory reset state to the updated firmware state. Now, what we wanted was confidence at UI level, a test that's easy to run. And what we did was, okay, here's the first step from factory reset state. We activate it, we get to the activated state. And then from activated state, we update and we get to the updated state. How do I do the second test, for instance? Now, all we have to do is stop everything relevant to the activated state and then use the UI to update, right? We just click this button. And then finally we stop everything that has to do with the updated state. So maybe this needs like eight to 10 fixtures to trick the UI to, to thinking, hey, there's a network layer there. The benefit here is that it only takes eight seconds to run versus 15 minutes and hardware dependency changing the state and everything. So this is something you can utilize in your own environment if you have to record so many fixtures. Now let's talk about visual AI with Percy. And the, the challenge here is that, okay, we can have full control over the DOM and assert against it, but what do we do with CSS? Should definitely check out Glef's post on visual testing. One thing I want to highlight is, okay, we use Percy and this was hard to figure out for me, so I just want to share. Percy, Ezek, and then the rest is the same. And what we do here is that we specify the test, test in the uh, config file and those tests, Yep, yep, let's let's just talk about that later. Uh, here's an example. Right? This is an SDG, a chart where a customer would look at their system and think, say, okay, this is what's happening in my building. In this example, I have a light switch, which I turn on or off. When it's in red, it's called to alarm. So what I want to do is see how I can zoom into this. In non-visual tests, which always run, I can only zoom in and check the length of the track. But and still have this code here, Percy has only run in visual AI jobs and they take a snapshot. Okay. Now, what does that look like in their cloud service? They support two browsers and you can define multiple viewports. So just this snap in takes six, does six tests and then does visual diffing in between. Uh, so it has this nice representation. But the other aspect is that when there are these minor changes, minor details that you're okay with, the, the plate services can say, okay, that's a false positive. Now that's my baseline. And then next time this kind of a visual diff happens, I'm not gonna bother you, I'm just going to test that. And so I think that's good for that reason. So the other topic is kind of controversial, but it's important to have test confidence throughout development. I think this is primary for the team. Also, maybe you don't have control over your pipeline. You have shared resources. You can't always rely on it. And once you're confident that your tests are flake free and they would not be failing because of the pipeline, 
how do you reveal those real ambiguous defects that may leak into the field, right? So this is a strategy for that. This gentleman here has a plugin. He's a Cypress employee. It's a controversial topic. So I recommend that you read the Google blog post about what they do with their flaky tests and why they are real. The way to use a plugin is either at test level, you can use it. You can use it at the top of a describe block. It doesn't run the setup steps. Or you can use it in CLI, which is more of a do it for everything shotgun approach. Uh, I want to say that right now it's a plugin that Ben has released, but we are putting this into the core Cypress, so it will be built in. And if you use Cypress dashboard, it will actually show you this information, even though the task has passed on retry, you will still get this information about each task. So maybe you can look more into the test and why it sporadically fails. Super. So we're confident that our tests are good. We're confident that the failures or retries aren't happening because of the pipeline. What's next? So here's a snapshot from the pipeline. This is a long running hardware test, usually runs in about six minutes. So it ran at a reasonable time. It didn't fail because of the pipeline because then it would take a longer time, but it had to retry. Cypress gives you this first indication that there is some, something going on at the system level which you should be detecting. And these are those defects that sometimes happen, especially with eventually consistent systems. And these are the expensive failures that will leak out to the field. That's the indication, but you should be testing these with the right tool for the job. There are so many performance testing tools out there. This is one of the tools that we use, and I would recommend that you go and check it out to detect these kind of issues. Now, Sci API with the Maestro himself. So why use this thing? Right? We already have Sci request. It has retryability. It does it for four seconds. But what if you need to do it for longer? We have an eventually consistent system. Even our item potent requests like get may not be ready on time, right? In the pipeline, it may even take longer. So what do we do? Also, okay, now when you run locally, you have dev tools, you can exactly see what happened at network layer, but what if it runs in CI? How do you know what failed really, right? So Sci API, very similar to Sci request. It has retry and status code failure property, but it can also take a sub test name which makes time travel debugging and diagnosing a lot easier. At the same time, you can define a timeout and the timeout will be retried if you follow that with a should, right? So you don't have to do hard sleeps. You can just await and not sleep. What would you do with side requests? Only four seconds. What would you do with other API testing tools? And API testing is language agnostic you have this kind of capability. And maybe you have postman, you do new man, you wait for two seconds. It sometimes works in the pipeline, usually doesn't. You increase the timer. This is not the way to go. Definitely not the way to go with an eventually consistent system. This also provides you screenshots, video. The only restriction is that if you're using a UI, you can't use Sci API because it takes over your UI here. I have to blur this for information security reasons, but mainly this is what we, you would see at in DevTools, so you have that ability all there. So these are some CRUD tests, only 10 to 15 lines of code. And all I do is do some data-driven testing. I have a combinatorial model from a CSV file, which I convert to JSON, just slap that in, and that's the only thing that has to change in here. Very Murat, easy. I have to say that you can just go to Sci API GitHub repo to see a similar video in action. Yes. All it does, it takes the request object and the response and just puts it where usually the application is during UI testing. So you can see the request and responses going in and out. All right, side pipe. Another gentleman, Nicholas Ball, definitely someone to follow in the community and learn from. <laughs> so what does this solve for us, side pipe? Now Cypress has built-in retryability for any request that's item potent that does not change the state of the system. But if you have these race conditions in the pipeline and you want to retry some actions that may change application state, you should check out Gleb's blog post and he talks about side pipe in detail in there. So an example here, we have a filtering functionality. Let's say these are device and point combinations in the system. And I want to look at only the points that do light switches, only the points that measure pressure, for instance. Then this list is only client side. As we add more tags, the list keeps decreasing. 
sometimes in the pipeline that was happening was we click on an item on the list before the list is finalized and then we get the wrong item on the right side. So how did we solve this eventually? With SciPipe, all you have to do is get a, a synchronous function and you pass it to pipe. If you follow that with a should, that assertion will be retried until it passes or it times out. Nice. So that's one tool to use uh, to counter flake in the pipeline. But SciPipe is good for that or client side issues. What if you need a network dependency? Now wait until it's by Stefano, a very useful tool. He has an online book that I refer to a lot more than I contribute to, definitely check it out. But let's say we have this issue where I am commanding a light switch, I'm just turning it on. And sometimes when I run it in the pipeline, I click just maybe the test run too fast, I click it, nothing happens, okay? the ideal situation to create a synchronous jQuery function that clicks on that button. Similar idea, Gleb has a post on Cypress tricks with conditional testing. Right? So you want to have something that is not asserting what it's doing, but just doing that synchronously. You pass that to SciPipe and then follow with a should. It keeps retrying until the button is grayed out or it's not there anymore. But we had regression during development and SciPipe wasn't enough to solve this problem. And Stefano himself helped me with this. So in this example, all we're doing is we're setting up a route and we're saying, hey, any post request that's going out to this endpoint, if it ever goes out, set this flag to true. So this is just a sniffer. And post request goes out, set it to true. Wait until only needs a function that returns a Boolean result. So we click the button using Cypress and then we just set the flag. Hey, if the post request goes out, flag stays false, wait until has returned false. It will try out every one second here for 10 seconds. And if it can't do it at the end, it will give you a message. Stefano added some more options since I showed this to him, which you should check out at the link. But so this basically gives you a full network awareness as you're doing it. Click the button, did the post go out? Nope, click it again until it goes out and get stability in the CI environment. I have to say, Murad, that wait until is pretty powerful because it allows you to retry something until arbitrary Boolean condition predicate becomes true. So in this case, you know, you're waiting for the network request to go out, right? Completely unrelated operation to the button and very, very hard to you know, implement otherwise. But this is such an elegant solution. Okay, we talked about the plugins. Now we can start talking about app actions. Gleb, you mind taking over here? Absolutely. So a lot of people ask us about how do we recommend doing uh, page objects and so on. So in Cypress, you can implement everything. You can implement little utility functions. You can implement build page objects on top of Cypress commands. But you also have access to the underlying application. So you can implement something we call app actions. So in a typical code, typical case, you have your tests, right? And Cypress operates on a DOM, right? It goes for UI elements. You can build page objects that just abstract those actions, but they still go for the DOM. That means they go for HTML application code, right? Or the elements until they reach your application code. And this border between the page objects and you know, your HTML or DOM is very, very shaky, I would say. There is no linter, but we'll tell you, oh, you're using a selector, but selector is no longer there because application has changed. So as you go down, right, you make actual calls to your uh, API database and so on. So the Cypress gives you access to that iframe where your application is running. So you have direct access to the DOM. That's why you can do site click, site type. You have access to location cookies and the application code. We also have access to the network, right? So you can stop and spy on network requests. But right now, let's talk about the application code. So the interesting thing, and Murat, maybe you should show this because you've done this. So I just followed Glib's blog and then tinkered with it and tried to reproduce it in my own environment mainly. But all you need is a, a conditional to say, if you're running Cypress, set your component, very similar to how you would do it in React or Vue. This is an Angular example. So you say, okay, side window, the window, the DOM should have a property with the name of your component. And since you have should here, it will keep retrying until this component gets mounted, right? 
that's very elegant there, very, very cool utility that you can take advantage of. After that point, maybe you want to look into your component. Maybe that has properties that you can change. You can control the system with. This is how it looks in DevTools. Then your other option is to look at your component code, see if you have any public functions. You can invoke that with Scimoke. So it's interesting that you can reach inside your component, even it has been initialized sometime later, because you doing this should have property your component, which retries. And when you look inside the component and maybe you access internal state and you use it in your assertions, this is pretty nice. So how do we take advantage of such a thing? Let's say I have points in the system and they're supposed to have certain icons. I want to test that all the invalid icons aren't displayed and all the valid icons are displayed properly. So one way to do this is maybe to use real hardware, which is really painful, or maybe you can fixture these. Still, I did not want to maintain any fixtures. All I want is visualness. Are they loading? Does the down look okay? That's it. So here in this function, I use the app action to get a list and I'm just passing the array in there. Only display the array, however many invalid icons or valid icons there, just display that. Go through each one and set the attribute, right? So we use that function to set up the component. Okay, maybe it's setting up with everything void and the other one is setting with the valid icons. We can do any kind of assertion. We can use the component also to do the assertion, but I'm capable of asserting with the DOM and getting a little more value out of my test here. Now, finally, I combo that with visual verification for these icons. So there are two distinctions here that maybe you don't have the capability in built-in tools like Karma, Enzyme, or Storybook. You're doing DOM assertion, higher value from the test, still really fast to set it up, right? And then we're doing visual diffing. It's, it's pretty nice, I have to say. Uh, sorry, because that invalid list, it's an edge case, right? It's very hard to set up such tests if you don't have control over all the data, right? Because it should be invalid. And yet you're looking right inside the component and directly give it edge case data and then asserting how the component renders it. All right, here is another example. So now we're looking at a device which I have to blur out, but the only thing that matters here, deleting a device or deleting a point under the device. So the right pane would be, I click on one of the points under the device. Maybe this is something that is a thermostat. It shows our data. Now I want to either, in the first case, delete the device. And then what happens is that both these components go away and we get redirected to a previous page. In the second case, from the initial state, we delete a point and the right pane goes away, only the device stays. But there is a third case here, that is a certain flow. First, you delete the right side and the left side. And doing this purple path, I don't want to repeat my UI test. I already tested all the confirmation of the delete, the cancellation. All I want is, okay, what happens when I do one at a time? Now these tests take about 20 seconds with the UI, but if I use component testing here, not only I can test a sequence that's not covered in the UI test, but also combination of components. So all I do is app action, delete the right pane, and then check that the right pro pane property got unloaded while the left side is still existing. And then I do another one to delete the left pane and ensure that both of them are gone and I didn't redirect it to another URL. This takes about two seconds versus a lot longer, and I'm not repeating the UI test. Nice. This is very powerful, but make sure you're still getting value out of testing the user interface because it's always a challenge of what's the investment, how much value you get. Very little investment, high value over here. Okay, talked about app actions, then let's talk about the dashboard. So for us, this saves a lot of time. And the table you could represent to your upper management could look like this. So 1,500 seconds for a serial execution for us, 400 seconds for parallel on average, almost four times as much gain for us. And every execution saves us 1,100 seconds. Now we do about 4,000 pipelines, which means that one second saved is one person hour. That's huge. Per quarter, that's 306 person hours. We have 194 tests, which this package gives us more than that. And I'm sorry. 
and the cost of that in a quarter is almost nothing, right? The cost savings overall is huge. Now, the counter argument to this is that, okay, maybe you can define some parallel jobs, some other machines yourself, and then put those test specs in there, keep maintaining it. But this is only fun to figure out once, and then it becomes a chore that takes a lot of time. I'll let you take over here, Clive. How does the dashboard work? So when we look at all machines that come online and join the group and join the test run, all of them send and try to execute the same set of spec files, the ones that you specified in your Cypress JSON or custom config file. And then our API looks at previous historical test runs and it tries to just tell each machine which spec to run. So you don't have to manually define the order. So for example, we allocate specs to machines. So if you bring more machines, they just automatically get jobs. Also, the important thing is for optimal uh, utilization of your machines, you want to run the longest running specs first and then you know, the shortest ones at, at, at the very end. In that case, you won't be stuck you know, waiting for very long spec to finish at the very, very end, increasing the total runtime. So we do for this automatically. We update the historical average automatically. So you never have to worry about efficient utilization of all your machines. The only thing you still have to do manually, which we can't really tell you, we can tell you, you know, what's the slowest run, but you still manually have to sometimes look at the longest running spec and split it into shorter specs so we can actually allocate uh, those two new specs and put them into pipeline. But everything else happens like magic. Okay, all right. Uh, this is a little complicated topic, but there are plenty of references and there. I'm a combinatorial testing fan because of the cost effectiveness of using it. There is some theoretical math going on here. You can check more out at National Institute of Standards Technology link. If you're in America, your tax dollars pay for this kind of research. So make use of it. Mainly the idea is that it gives you the ability to run a minimal test set or have a minimal test configuration. And it says that, okay, if you model this correctly, you will find a certain percentage of issues that may arise from the system. So a, a, a good claim there. What they did was they did reverse engineer studies over many different kinds of software from various industries, including weapons development. On the left side, we have the percentage of issues found. And then on the bottom side, they're testing parameters of interaction. For instance, in our configuration, CI configuration test, we're maybe just varying the browser. And when we're testing two-way things, maybe we're varying the browser and the test suite. And then it says, okay, if you're doing that, whatever system you have, we have not seen any case where we found less than half the issues. And in some cases, we found up to 95% of the issues. So it's risk-based, but a calculated risk that you can back up. Now, there are many combinatorial testing tools, and you can find more of them on pairwise.org. This is CT Wedge, developed in the University of Bergamo, Italy, by some friends of mine. The reason I shared this is that you can just copy this model, go to the link, paste it, and see the results for yourself. Now, here, if you look at uh, the model, there are three parameters for the deployment of the UI, either branch development staging, two parameters possible for the API, Okay, and then different kinds of spec suites. So this is our setup right now, basically. And we run on Chrome and Electron, right? So this would be three times two times three times two, 36 exhaustive configurations. When you do the model, it gives you five combinatorial configurations. So if you just look at it, okay, in branch levels, it's recommending to switch the browser while running the spec or services that are being stopped. At development level, okay, do that similar thing with cross browser and in staging, run the hardware test suite. The constraints, oh, before that, why is Cypress so flexible with this? How does it accommodate that? So we used to record that parallel to make sure we're doing the best kind of CI cost utilization and everything's very fast, as fast as it can be. The first parameter, the deployment UI is configured with a config file. The deployment API is configured using server test and being able to remote a proxy. The third parameter, the spec suite, we can configure with a spec parameter or use a config file. 
The browser parameter is pretty easy to configure as well. Cypress gives you another parameter, which for now we use just for nice naming convenience in the dashboard, but it's open-ended. So if you have another parameter in your CI environment, you can use it for that. And constraints, you can learn the syntax right here, just copy it and play around with it. But basically it says that if you're doing staging, run all the tests, match the deployments. If you're doing branch testing, which is UI, definitely stop the services and you're at develop, the development level, then make sure you're testing that API and the services. So these are all the requirements that I have. 36 down to five configs. Now, here is a realistic case that everyone will go I'm not going to ask when you have Firefox support. What when you do, Gleb is going to have a post talking about why you don't really need to run your entire test suite in the different browser also, which would double your CI costs. Right? The only parts that matter here is that I've added a new browser, Firefox, and then I added a new test suite called SpotCheck. Right? This is a subset of my full test suite. And with some instrumentation, you can calculate how much coverage that gives you. And Gleb will talk about in his blog post all the details about that. Now, the only constraint here, when you go to the presentation, you can copy it and the rest of them are there. You can see it for yourself. But only on the only extra thing it says, if there is Firefox, use the spot check suite, vice versa. So this is a two way arrow. You can see the combinatorial comp explosion already, right? So it's up to 72 exhaustive configurations. But that comes to six configurations when you do the modeling. So the only thing that got added here is the spot check test suite with Firefox. Now it's running that on development layer, which is interesting, right? Maybe you would make a calculated guess that no, I don't want to run this on branch levels because then I would run it branch levels execute too often. Maybe you want to run it on staging, which would be okay decision, but the model says if you run it like this, then you will have better pairwise coverage overall. So it's recommending you to do it at development level. So you make a decision and you can back this up with a mathematical model. Now, the tool that I use here is Cometrics online tool. All you need is you get your test suite, your test configuration, a CSV file, whatever you have, drag and drop, and it will give you five or six different kinds of coverage. Now, when I say coverage, Think about it as a measurement of completeness and trueness based on a model. Usually this model in the industry are the requirements, workflows, unit. Here I'm talking about combinatorial coverage. The tool is evaluating each configuration and it says your first configuration is giving a lot of relative coverage. The red is relative coverage per test. The blue one is cumulative coverage. And it says, maybe your second one isn't giving you that much value. So maybe with some risk, you can eliminate that one. It's definitely saying that the fifth one doesn't give any value to you guys. So well, let's look at what the fifth one is there. So it says on the de development, when you're running the services electron. So immediately eliminate that one. Now what's significant here? We're still at five configurations. We added a new browser, we added new tests, but our CI cost didn't change. Our confidence increased so much though. So you get a lot of value out of this. The alternative would be to do a shotgun grid approach, which is still costly, right? You don't need any of this. 72 down to five, five configs to cover browsers, test layers, deployments, huge cost reduction, and calculated feasible risk that you can back up. I see. I mean, at Cypress, we would be happy if you ran all 72 permutations of all parameters because then you'd have to subscribe to a custom you know dashboard plan we'll be just happy but <laughs> you use mathematical modeling to select just a set of parameters that you will run with you still have according to the mathematical model you still will have high confidence that will find all the issues that are in your possible in your code but yet run just a minimal subset not all, but perhaps a good percentage. We don't know exactly. what's, your, what's your system like. And all you have to do is go to the slide examples, copy the script, go to the link, paste it, and now you will be able to learn for yourself. Oh, CI cost savings, all right. The key benefits and metrics. Now, the, the management slide, which they love. So we were blessed because one year, we did an initial version of the application, which didn't have anything to do with Go Lambdas, just microservices. The second year, we integrated with these services, which makes a future-proof platform for other products to exist on, right? So it was very difficult initial release. We had to double the UI code. 
But the interesting thing here, when we were using Protractor WebDriver, we had 2,300 lines of code. The legacy functionality to test the same thing with Cypress, we only needed half as much. I think this is significant. I don't have to write as much code, for instance, not needing page objects, but even then it is so efficient. The other part is that if we were able to be a lot more productive, so because what we do works and we're able to do more instead of why is the test not working in the pipeline, real verification validation, real defect diagnosis, improving coverage, preventing future issues that may happen, all value add activities. One reason of that is we did not have too much time. We didn't have to spend too much time with defect detection and diagnosis. Because quoting Stefan Amani here, tests don't fail if the app is working, you don't have false negatives. When they fail, they drive us directly to the issue because we have test isolation. We have time travel debugging in the Cypress test runner. You can locally run your code and debug while running your end-to-end -end tests. And we think that's just next level, right? Just you would do in your <laughs> testing. You can't do it with the end-to-end -end testing. It has also implications on effect of end-to-end -end test on your unit test coverage, which Clip has many blog posts about. Also, you have the CI video and screenshots. So you can see how all this power enables you to say something like, I'm spending a third as much time hands down diagnosing and quote me on this. And that's a modest statement. And, and Murat, I haven't paid you any money to say that, just to be no, clear, yes. right? <laughs> if you expect me to cut a paycheck, you'll be waiting for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is just reciprocation. Right? We, we've solved a lot of problems thanks to these. So the CI execution speed. I compared our legacy tests, mostly other hardware, very slow, and I don't need five CI machines for these. So your experience will vary, but at minimum, it's going to benefit you about two and a half as much gain. For us, it's almost four times as much gain. Right? So this is another metric that we want to share. At the high level in a graph, so in the bottom, you have percentages, and on the left side, you have those parameters. Green and Cypress, WebDriver projected in red, less is better. So less time to automate, majorly less time to diagnose, half as much lines of code to do the same thing, and much less time to CI execution. So we were lucky that we were able to get these metrics because in two fiscal years, we had the application with different versions and a totally different test framework. Excellent. That's a very good result. I, I really hope that, you know, um... You write more tests, release more often, have no issues for your customers, and Cypress is a tool of your choice. Thanks. Okay, what have you learned at Siemens? What have you learned? We, we, we can state that end-to-end -end tests can provide high value and be painless, still painless. And the secret sauce is isolation of tests and an enriched test portfolio. And with that, we can start going to the questions. So let me pull uh, the questions from Slido. Uh, Magnolia, I seem to be having problems with our question panel from Slido. Let me open it again. Just one second. OK. Uh, so Murat, can you see the questions yes, on the screen, sure. right? Sure. And again, like, thank you for everyone who's asking questions. Um, we, we do appreciate, you know, you joining the webinar and taking time to listen to us. Uh, we try, we'll try to answer. We don't have that many questions, so probably will be easy for us. Uh, Murat, is there anything that jumps at you? That well, we'll, start like with the, we'll start with the highest thumbs up, I guess. Maybe at mm -hmm. some points we weren't super clear, but. Yes, you have to update your stubs if your API changes, but hopefully your API changes a lot less than your UI. The two plugins that we shared already have utilities to do that. And if you go back to the slides, if you scroll further down, I didn't share that part, but there is a utility to, if you can do this manually, to switch to recording mode versus switch to uh, playing mode. So mm -hmm. this, this was thought about and it's already taken care of. I just didn't share that detail. I see. Uh, is there anything? Oh, this is a good one. Uh, that's okay. So um, I, I, we tried Apple Tools too. 
uh, at the time I tried, amplitudes needed three commands. So one, Sai open eyes, uh, Sai look at what's happening, and Sai close eyes. I think they've improved on this, and now they have one command. So Percy had one command, and it worked a little more seamlessly. Also, um, I got sold because there was a trial version, <laughs> uh, which I could have a proof of concept, because every time you bring in like a service, saying to a big company, it's going to cost something. They're like, ah, no, no, we don't want cost. So you can first start trying it and show the value it's bringing, and then we go bigger scale. It's a, it's a lesson for everyone out there who's thinking about doing SaaS, right? You have to have free trial. Yes. If you're writing a tools for developers to bring into a company, give them a free trial. Otherwise, it's a, it's a risky bet. Uh, to be fair, uh, Aptitudes gave me two weeks. And uh, it took a while getting to work. It was hard to make work. Uh, it's also on me, but two weeks was not enough for this. I see, I see. Yeah. Um, where can we get more details about your combinatorial test philosophy? So we just go to the slide. Uh, the top link is from NISD. They will link to papers uh, there. And if you go to the bottom link, which says, look at slide 16, to 50, that's another presentation I did really broke this down with a very simple example. And me and Gleb went through this. What do you think, Gleb? Was that a high level good explanation? It's a high level, it, it still is a mathematical model. So your results might vary. And I, I would say, think back about the issues you found, right, during your test and see if your tests are realistic, right? If they actually model realistic behavior. Um, can I ask you, Murad, because you didn't talk about this, how do you log in in your application in, from, in your tests? <laughs> so props goes to um, an entry-level developer we had, Joel Whalen. He was with us for, I think, about six months, and he really helped in the beginning with this. But I'll tell you that our login is not very simple. Uh, we have something called Siemens ID, which is like an internal third party, which wraps auth zero. Mm -hmm. Okay, so figuring out login was not super simple, but now if you just uh, Google Auth0 Cypress, also I have a GitHub example in my own GitHub, it will show you exactly what's happening. So you send a request, get a token, place it in whatever you have to place it in, in your browser, and then seamlessly you log in. Yes, login is not easy. It's, log pro it's programmatic login, right? Yes, well, you test. can also do UI login. But we only do that in one test, and in every other test, you log in programmatically. Excellent. Um, Good question. Uh, are you satisfied with tutorial interaction testing? About freeway, right? And uh, to be honest, Murat had slides where he discussed two-way versus freeway, and it just became, to me, a little bit more confusing. But we did discuss it, and if you go to the slides, right, to his our presentation, it actually shows two-way versus three-way. But if you remember the chart, right, the most important thing is from one to two parameters, like everything increases, you are more likely to find issues, right? Yes. But then it kind of drops off because it becomes like a low diminishing returns. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it's a great question. Obviously, someone that knows about combinatorial testing. It's always um, a, a trade-off of, okay, how much do you want to invest and how much risk is there? How much value are you getting out of this? So if you plug in that same model, copy to the tool and choose three-way testing and see how much more CI you have to use for this, we thought mm, maybe, you know, we haven't run into issues yet. I think we're pretty confident with two-way or if we ever start having issues, then perhaps we'll try three-way testing. So costly, cost is the reason. Yes, yeah. yes. And it's good enough the way it is. Excellent question. Um, Murad, do you want to talk about this? Because you had to take over a legacy application and legacy tests and then develop new version of application and write new tests completely from scratch. You want to answer these questions, how to manage tests and legacy products? Um, yeah, excellent question. So maybe we have another project that I uh, previously started a test framework using Protractor and they're still invested in that. Um, I believe this is still a, a case of, okay, with these legacy tests, doing traditional end-to-end -end testing, how much success do you have in the pipeline? How much does it cost you? So you monetize that cost, and then you try to monetize the cost to switch, and then you can make a comparison. But yeah, it's always a difficult choice. 
Um, what I did was when we were first bringing it in, I made a simple repository comparing uh, robot framework, protractor, and Cypress. Uh, Stefano and I are planning to make another uh, article at least comparing Test Cafe with Cypress. Okay, what's the cost? Hands on experience. Um, so then uh, we, we were kind of blessed. So I can't really assert spot on uh, because we rewrote the application, right? Uh, yeah. But in, in this kind of a situation, then you would do a trade off analysis because you know, you want, do you want to have high gains initially or do you want to have high gains in the long run? In the meta, you have to run things consistently in the pipeline. Right. This, right. Is, the, this is the end game. Can I ask you an related question? So when you had the legacy existing test suite, yes. did you start rewriting it or did you start using Cypress to write new tests? How did so, you- So yeah, great question. So there was many lines of code and uh, it almost took me like nine months to get rid of the code. <laughs> mm -hmm. I still had like one protracted test suite running. Uh, you will realize as you have to, uh, you just started writing new ones in our case. New but uh, uh, as soon as you realize how easy and seamless it is to create new tests with Cypress, you don't want to suffer the pain of test maintenance with your legacy code. I see. That was my experience. And I endured it for a pretty long time. And as soon as our third party uh, login authentication changed their UI and I had to maintain these page objects, uh, and, and then I could do the same thing in five lines of code in Cypress. Then I, uh, okay, no, no worries. <laughs> I see, I see. Um, can I ask you, like, this is the second question, right? Uh, okay. Why did you use Cypress for API tests, right? So it okay, it's fine to use for UI testing. We understand that, but why would mm -hmm. you use Cypress for API testing if there are other tools? No, I can't comment on Axios, which I have not used. But the problem we're trying to solve is we have this challenge of eventually consistent system. So we make a request. Usually, you can say, okay, within two seconds, something should come back. And in maybe another component, we use Postman and new pipelines, and it works okay there. We haven't made Cypress tests there, but the eventually consistent system, even your item potent get requests are not guaranteed to happen in a certain time, right? So you have to have an asynchronous utility there. I've heard that a C sharp library provides you this, but besides that, I haven't heard otherwise. Um, Cypress just made it seamless and easy. And after Sci API, where we could see a video of the API test happening in the pipeline, <laughs> that was kind of a no brainer. But I, I can't make a one-on-one -on -one comparison because have you used Axios Quad? Axios is just a little utility library for making HTTP requests, kind of like you know fetch. Or... Okay. Which like is it still JS? Yeah, it's, it's still JavaScript, right? Okay. It's a library that people often use on the front end to actually mm. make API requests. So it's not a testing tool; it's just okay. a library for making requests. Uh, I see. Um, but uh, yeah. the way I've you know, why I've written Sci API is just exactly what you, you said, right? You want to be able to retry requests and you want to be able to see them visually uh, after the test run so you can actually debug and understand what's happened. You can always implement a retry logic, right? So you're polling synchronously, but it's costly, right? Why yes. do you want to add more, add more stuff? I mean, you're trying right. to have soup with a, with a fork, right? That's right. the main reason, I guess. Um, so we still have a few minutes, so maybe two or three questions. Um, do you use a Cypress testing library or do you create uh, similar abstractions, right? It's actually, um, yeah, I started using it because I like it. Um, I think in, so little technical detail here. Whenever you are using Cy within uh, and then go in that closure and um, I use, let's say, get by text, uh, from Cypress testing library, I've, I've seemed to have uh, better luck than sometimes site contains, but I use Cypress testing library, yes, and I am converting some of my uh, selectors to that. It's an excellent library. We highly recommend it. It allows you to write tests to the interface rather than like implementations. So, so they've, they've done nice abstractions. And if you know Cypress testing library, then you know React testing library, there is a whole family with similar API. Good question. Like-minded thinking. Yeah. Um, do you think that uh, you understand the first question, how best to group tests like UI only, end-to-end -end smoke test? I'm not sure. So, about... so it completely depends on your test strategy. For our case, I wanted to isolate 
UI from the tightly coupled API as service layer, and then the hardware challenge. Um, but people have different solutions. I think uh, Stefano has a nice presentation on what he prefers. I don't know where, maybe it's in one of the links, but it's a test strategy issue. Excellent. So uh, what question do you think we should answer? Let's, let's answer one more. Okay. Which you pick. Um, which, which, uh, so this is a question I think you covered in the presentation, but just I think it bears repeating. Okay. What percentage of your tests use stub versus full end? -to -end? Ah, okay. And so how do you decide? The, the, the test, the only test that I don't stop, let's say I have, let's say 200 tests, I think about 20 are pure end to end. Um, I think I am, uh, there's like about 50 to 100, let's say, that I am switching based on whichever um, layer I'm testing. Let's say I'm on UI layer only, everything stubbed. And then if I'm testing services, okay, I want network governance. So 50 to 100, I'm switching. And then I think I have about uh, 50 to 100 API tests. So only 20 pure API tests. And why? I made a link to Stefano's presentation there. You can get almost 90% of the value from UI integration tests that isolate the UI and mark the network there. And I think it's nice because you still test those API endpoints but only when you actually merge things into develop and staging and productions, right? When you do pull requests and you work on UI, but it makes little sense to run the full end-to-end -end test. So it's fine to use marks because you know, once you merge, you're still gonna hit everything. And plus you have API tests. So uh, Murat, I, I just wanna thank you so much. Uh, amount of work you've done writing tests and amount of work you've done putting those test into nice presentation and preparing everything so people can you know learn from you is it, a lot thank you thank very well, much well you've, you've given plenty of feedback many other people have given plenty of negative feedback <laughs> so it, the, 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 the thanks goes to these group of people that made it possible and thanks for giving the opportunity this was very exciting i'm glad to have contributed to the community if you have any questions reach on linkedin or my first name dot my last name at siemens.com i'd be glad to answer any questions Excellent. And just to remind people, the link to the slides is cypress.slides.com slash cypress.io. And if you register for this webinar, we'll send the video when it gets published and this link to the slide deck later. So thank you very much for listening to us. Have a great day, everyone.